multiple times. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, the statistical mechanics of near extremal black holes. So what I mean by statistical mechanics is that uh, black holes can typically viewed, uh, be viewed as quantum systems, uh, just like systems in condensed matter that have uh, energy levels. So what I'm really talking about is what are the energy levels of uh, a type of black holes that, uh, that we'll see are called near extremal. So that's what the talk is about. And uh, most of this work is in collaboration with uh, uh, Heidemann, uh, Zhao, and Teriachi. Um, and uh, the, the flavor of this talk is somewhat similar to the flavor of uh, the ADS-CMT. But the difference is that while typically in ADS-CMT, we use some weakly coupled gravitational description to describe some, uh, some strongly coupled condensed matter system, this talk is kind of the, uh, the opposite of that. Uh, namely, we'll use universal features um, in a condensed matter system to uncover some universal properties in gravity that go even beyond anti de Sitter. So uh, they apply even in flat space um, as, as we'll see in what follows. Um, so more specifically, um, the systems that uh, I will be describing today on, uh, on the condensed matter side, um, will be the SYK model, which uh, I'm sure you've all heard a lot by now. Uh, it's a system with uh, 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 a number of fermions interacting via some uh, uh, coupling that is chosen from an uh, ensemble of distri an, a distribution. The, the coupling is chosen from, uh, let's say, a Gaussian distribution. And at low energies, it flows to uh, a quantum mechanical system which uh, people typically call the Schwarzian theory. It could also flow to something more complicated. But what we'll use today is uh, the universal features that uh, the Schwarzian theory reveals. So uh, on the gravity side, um, on the other hand, uh, what we'll be describing will be um, a type of black hole called the near extremal black hole, which have the following universal features. Uh, as you go close to the horizon of the black hole, it just so happens that the uh, space always separates into a product of two spaces. On the one hand, uh, you have um, uh, hyperbolic space, which I represented here through a sketch by Escher. Um, and uh, you could have some generic other manifold, uh, which for instance, for black holes, uh, for near extremal black holes that could exist in our own universe would be a two dimensional sphere. Um, and uh, the, the important feature of these near extremal black holes is that they have extremely low temperatures. Uh, they have this universal geometry and they could have a fairly large charge and arbitrarily large mass. So we're not talking about uh, black holes in which, uh, you know, which are microscopic in size. We could talk about even like uh, solar, solar mass black holes. And why this should interest you is because um, these systems are similar to the statistical mechanics of these systems is similar to what happens in a fixed charge sector in a generic quantum mechanical system. So uh, before I go into describing the relation between uh, the low energy theory of the SYK model and uh, these near extremal black holes, um, I just want to um, uh, show you an old puzzle um, about uh, the thermodynamics of, uh, of, of such black holes. Um, so the old puzzle goes as follows. Uh, these uh, black holes are, uh, as many of you know, uh, systems that are thermal in nature. Uh, they radiate and the radiation is called Hawking radiation. So they have a temperature. Um, and their mass depends, uh, you can explicitly de determine how the mass of such black holes depend on, depends on the temperature. And uh, if the temperature is zero, then uh, the mass of the black hole is, uh, we'll just call it M0, and uh, such black holes are called extremal. Now, what happens if we turn on the temperature a little bit? So right now the system is at zero temperature, but if we turn on the system a little bit, these other black holes that have non-zero temperature are called near extremal. And the important aspect uh, in this diagram is that the energy or mass of such black holes uh, scales with the temperature squared. 
Um, so why is this a problem? Well, if I go to low enough temperatures, you could think about what happens when you radiate a single, uh, a single Hawking quanta. So these black holes are like black bodies. And we all know that the average energy of, let's say, a, a photon radiated by um, a black body is given as roughly proportional to its temperature. So um, if, if I'm far away from the black hole, I could see this Hawking quanta measure its energy, should see that it's proportional to its temperature. But on the other hand, the, uh, if the energy is proportional to the temperature, it means that if I radiate even a single quanta, at low temperature, so let's say I'm here and I radiate one quantum of Hawking radiation, then um, the black hole loses a lot of its mass. So it moves from this point of, on the curve to somewhere else in such a fashion that the temperature changes by an order one amount. So of course, this sounds like a very big problem because as you all, um, all know very well, um, in thermodynamics, we always assume that uh, we can radiate, you know, uh, an infinite number of degrees of freedom in order to equilibrate with the bath. Um, so uh, here, what seems to be happening is that at low enough temperatures, um, the thermodynamic assumption fails. So the black holes kind of don't look thermal anymore. And uh, uh, you know, you, the Hawking radiation doesn't uh, behave as expected. So um, the, the question is, uh, what happens to uh, such black holes at very small energies? And typically, uh, what we're told to do uh, when we see such a failure of uh, semi-classical thermodynamics happening at low temperatures, we're typically instructed to look at the partition function or at uh, the density of states of, uh, of, uh, of such a system. Um, and um, the, the density of states uh, looks like this. Um, at large energies, uh, sorry, at, um, uh, at large energies, the uh, density of uh, states scales exponentially with the square root of the energy, but it's unknown what happens at, uh, at low energies. So what I showed in the plot above is the energy scale at which this uh, breakdown of thermodynamics occurred which people, and I'll explain in a second why, have called this energy scale E gap. Um, so uh, what, what's the role of the scale E gap in uh, the density of states? Well, people have conjectures because uh, thermodynamics fails uh, at that temperature. They have conjectures that something pretty drastic happens to the density of states. Um, namely, the conjecture was that uh, all the black holes have the following feature, um, that, uh, that they're, they're, the density of states is zero uh, within some interval between zero energy and the energy E gap. And then, you know, there is a, a pretty dense uh, number of states appearing here. They could be uh, separated by exponentially small amounts. Um, and there is a large degeneracy of states uh, right at zero energies. Um, and this was verified, um, but both, uh, both statements were verified uh, in uh, several papers uh, from the 90s, string theory papers. Um, for instance, uh, the fact that uh, black holes have uh, extremal, these extremal black holes have a large degeneracy was verified explicitly by something called microstate counting in which people literally counted uh, the degeneracy of the extremal states. Um, by Strominger and Papa. And uh, the scale, the scale E gap uh, was uh, conjectured uh, through some uh, constructions called D-brain constructions also in the 90s. So the, the questions that I'll try to answer to address today is, uh, is this feature really universal? Do all black holes have uh, this sort of gap? Or is it an artifact of the fact that uh, the string theory settings that the authors that I mentioned before uh, used uh, contain a, cer a certain amount of uh, supersymmetry, which is a symmetry that relates fermionic and bosonic degrees of freedom. Um, and more related to ABS-CMT, um, does this result apply to uh, Bryan-Sternorstroms or Kerr-Newman black holes, which are typically studied 
in ABS-CFT in systems that don't have supersymmetry. Good. Um, and a related question um, is um, what happens to uh, this degeneracy of states at extremality, so it's zero energies. Namely, um, what, what the calculation, semi-classical calculation suggests is that there is um, uh, a degeneracy of uh, the degeneracy of ground states that goes like e to the s zero, where s zero is the entropy of the black hole. And famously, uh, Hawking showed that the entropy of a black hole is proportional to its area divided by uh, measured in units of uh, the Planck length. Um, but in the absence of supersymmetry, what protects this degeneracy? So that's a pretty mysterious question. Um, and equal and equally mysterious question is like, if we are to take ADSCMT at face value, what would e to the s zero be in a condensed matter system? Usually when we go at a fixed charge, let's say we have a, a system that doesn't have too many global symmetries, we don't expect that if we go in a fixed charge, let's say U1 fixed charge sector, to have a huge degeneracy of states for the lowest energy state in that sector. And just to give you um, a perspective on how big this degeneracy of states could be, I could, for instance, take a, a solar mass black hole uh, at extremality, so uh, the mass of our sun. And uh, the degeneracy of states would be 10 to the 10 to the 76. So the entropy would be 10 to the 76. That's a huge degeneracy that doesn't have any symmetry motivations. So it's kind of crazy to believe, uh, unless something extremely special is happening, it's kind of crazy to believe that it actually is there. So, um, uh, in this talk, I'll try to explain how the, uh, what happens to this degeneracy and what happens to this gap scale. Is, that, is there really a gap in the density of states of the black hole or not? So instead of calling the scale E gap that people found in thermodynamics, that's the scale at which it was found that uh, the thermodynamics of black holes start failing, instead of calling it E gap, I'll call it ESL2 just to be, take an unbiased view and not confuse you guys um, that uh, E gap is uh, actually associated to a gap in the spectrum. Um, can you say, uh, excuse me, can you say what these states are? Like, is there any understanding of what these states are from string theory perspective? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're literally viewed as, uh, as uh, they're, they're called black hole microstates. So uh, they're literally viewed as, you know, the ground state is, uh, uh, some uh, configuration that could be made in terms of V-brain. And uh, all excited states can be made by exciting some stringy modes uh, in that ensemble of V-brains. Uh, so you should literally view the system analogously to uh, you know, uh, just the, your typical quantum mechanical system in which you have like energy levels and energy spacings. And what pe people typically do when they compute, uh, you know, energies of black holes or the entropy of black holes or stuff like that, they do everything in a semi-classical limit. So you can't actually see uh, the fine-grained nature of these microstates. For that, you need some like uh, UV completion of the theory. So in that sense, it's slightly different than uh, than your typical quantum mechanics. It's like a, a quantum mechanical system, but we don't know the full UV completion yet. Thank you. Okay, so the concrete computation that um, I'll, I'll try to explain today is uh, how to compute the partition function and density of states for such black holes at energies or temperatures propor pro proportional to the, to the gap scale that people discussed in the 90s in the canonical and grand canonical ensembles. So uh, for fixed charges or uh, for fixed chemical potentials. And um, first, um, I'll do this for uh, just uh, bl black holes in 4D Einstein-Maxwell theory. So just gravity in our own universe coupled to electromagnetism. Um, and then if I'll have time, I'll do the same in, uh, in supergravity, or at least I'll show you the results in supergravity and show you that there's a major difference between the black holes that have supersymmetry and those that, and those that don't. And the tool that I'll be using today that I've already alluded to 
in order to understand this, uh, the relation, in order to understand this partition function, we'll be using this low energy effective theory that universally appears in the low energy limit of the SYK models. And I have to mention that uh, there has been uh, tons and tons of past work explaining this relation uh, between uh, near extremal black holes and uh, this low energy effective theory of, of SYK. Uh, I think uh, it started with uh, a talk by Kitaev, uh, then Subir had an amazing paper. Um, and the, but the important distinction between um, these uh, past papers and what I'm gonna talk about now is that I'll try to address a regime in which the temperature is much lower uh, than uh, than the typically studied uh, than the people than the typically studied temperature, which is uh, people usually study the temperature T to much to be much bigger than the scale uh, ESL two. So I'll be interested in the partition function when T is of order ESL two. So in that regime, the as we'll see quantum effects become extremely important. So uh, the gravitational system cannot be studied solely by uh, doing a semi-classical analysis of the path integral, of a gravitational path integral. Okay, um, good. Um, so um, I'll start, as I previously mentioned, by discussing riester nordstrom black holes. Um, so these riester nordstrom black holes um, are, uh, just uh, the action, that they're just solutions for um, uh, the einstein hilbert action. Uh, we can have, uh, this is the curvature, scalar curvature. Uh, we can have an arbitrary cosmological constant in 4D. And we just couple uh, general relativity to electromagnetism. So to a U1 Maxwell theory. And the question is what, uh, how can we understand the partition function uh, associated uh, to such solutions. Um, and in order to do that, um, we can uh, do uh, the following trick, um, which is we can write um, the uh, uh, 4D metric, um, assuming, uh, making the assumption that uh, there's some spherical symmetry in the system. Um, and uh, we can make the following ansatz that uh, the spherical symmetry means that uh, everywhere the space has some internal sphere. Um, and uh, the metric on the remaining two dimensional space could be arbitrary. And we have a scalar parametrizing the size of the sphere, which is typically referred to as a dilaton. Um, and if we want to slightly break this spherical symmetry, we can also consider an additional SU2 gauge field, which captures the isometries of the sphere. So the reason why it's important to keep track of all these details um, is because if we want to understand the partition function in such a low temperature regime, uh, we have to understand really what fields contribute to the partition function of such black holes. Um, so if I just take this metric and plug it into the action that I previously mentioned, um, I get a more complicated two-dimensional theory um, that uh, still is a gravitational theory, but this time it's a gravitational theory coupled to the scalar chi that parametrized the area of the sphere um, uh, that uh, you know, represents the sphere that goes in the radial direction. Um, so um, th this is uh, this theory, this two-dimensional theory is called a theory of uh, 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 2D gravitational, 2D dilaton gravity. Um, and uh, it's coupled to uh, an SU2 Yang-Mills field that appears because we do a dimensional reduction on a sphere. A Victor, um, question? It's, yeah. Um, if you just took literally 4D GR and did this reduction in a near horizon region, would there be yeah. a separation of scales between what you're calling chi and the other modes that come from dimensional reduction on the sphere? Yes, yes, there would. Uh, not between chi and all the other modes, um, I'll, uh, but between chi, the gauge fields, and all the other massive modes that appear in the dimensional reduction. So what, 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 what's generating so, the separation of scales? It's not all just one over the radius of the sphere? It is, it is, it is. But the important thing is that I want to keep track of all the massless fields 
that appear in, uh, in the near horizon region in this reduction. So chi is one of them. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, metric itself is another one. Uh, then there's the SU2 gauge field. There's uh, the U1 field coming from Maxwell theory from higher dimensions. And those are all the massless modes. I see. So this, this effective that, theory is valid below scales of order one over R. Yes, exactly. Okay. So uh, exactly. Here I'll be consider, considering uh, scales for which beta, the inverse temperature, is much bigger than R0. So in that regime, these modes, from the perspective of the temperature, these modes seem extremely massive. So the entire point is that part of these modes can be integrated out um, and uh, do not contribute to uh, the temperature dependence of the partition function of black holes. So these guys we can throw away. So what remains is this theory of two-dimensional gravity coupled to two gauge fields. And the magic of two dimensions is that uh, these two-dimensional gauge fields that uh, whose contribution I wrote here can be integrated out exactly. So here, what we'd like to do is a computation that would be impossible in four-dimensional gravity. Um, what we'd like to do is uh, to integrate out, uh, to do a, 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 an exact path integral in the near horizon region of the black hole and integrate out these gauge fields that appeared from the dimensional reduction from higher dimensions and see what resulting theory we get. And the nice thing that we'll see is that the resulting theory starting from the gravity side will be precisely this low energy theory of the SYK model uh, that I've discussed Sorry. before. I, yes. I have a question. So Shama got me worried about something. Um, yes. It, it seems to me that the, the radius of the sphere and what you're reducing is, is actually proportional to, to one over chi. Uh, the radius of the sphere and so reducing is proportional to one over chi. Yes, that is correct. So yes. then it, it seems like that hierarchy of scale sort of breaks down when chi goes to zero. Chi goes to zero. Yes, that is correct. But chi never goes to zero. I mean, uh, this, because isn't that uh, the radius, the, the, the horizon of the black hole, chi, uh, is, uh, I think chi is at uh, r zero squared. So chi in, uh, in, in these solutions is always bounded. So that's a, so, that's a property of a solution, not a property of the, configure, of, the, of the field space, right? Yes, 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 yes. It's a property of the solution. So the thing that I'm doing here is that I'll go in the near horizon region for a certain solution and then expand all the fields around that, uh, around that solution and then evaluate the path integral in that expansion. I see, you're just doing small fluctuations around that solution. Uh, well, the fluctuations could be, uh, could be arbitrary in some sense, but um, uh, I, I, yeah, you're right that uh, I'm in a regime where I cannot make chi to, be, uh, to, be, uh, to go arbitrarily close to zero because then I can worry about uh, what happens to these massive modes. Okay, thanks. Right? Uh, good. Um, so the magic of these uh, two-dimensional gauge fields is that they can be integrated out uh, exactly um, using the fact that uh, in two dimensions, um, the partition function of Maxwell theory or Yang-Mills theory only depends on the area of the manifold. So this is a property that's very close. It's a bit weaker than saying that this gauge theory is topological. It simply uh, says that it's invariant under area preserving diffeomorphisms. Uh, good. So we can integrate out uh, this, uh, these two fields exactly and write uh, our partition function as, as a sum over different charges, Q and uh, angular momenta that the black hole could have. This is just what the um, uh, integrating out B and A spits out. It just spits out the uh, partition function as a sum over uh, U1 and SU2 representations. Um, so, um, and the, the feature is, the, uh, uh, the feature of this sum is that um, 
depending on what boundary conditions I put for the gauge fields associated to U1. So what boundary conditions I put for electromagnetism at asymptotic infinity, and what boundary condition I put for the SU2 gauge field at asymptotic infinity. Depending on those, I end up with uh, different chemical potentials, a chemical potential for the SU2 or SO3 gauge field, depending on whether or not I allow fermions, and the chemical potential for the U1. And then the, the simple result that I end up with is that I'm left with, uh, with a path integral over the stiloton field and the metric um, around uh, some theory of 2D diloton gravity that now just it depends explicitly on the charge Q and uh, the angular momentum J. Um, so just out of curiosity, you could take this action. We integrated out the gauge fields exactly, but you could take this action and try to find the classical solutions again uh, in order to find the saddle point for, uh, for this path integral. And what you'll find is that uh, if, uh, if I look, for instance, in the sector J equals zero, the solutions precisely yield the reinstein nordstrom solution. Um, and if I actually expand things at very small angular momenta, um, I precisely find that uh, the two-dimensional metric yields the Kerr-Newman solution with small angular momentum. So indeed, the identification of Q as the charge and J as the angular momentum of these two quantities that uh, appeared after I integrated out the gauge fields, the identification with them as charges in the system is correct. Um, so uh, from now, from convenience, I'll only show results uh, for which J is equal to zero. So I'll uh, work in the canonical ensemble with fixed SU2 charge and macrocanonical for, uh, for Q. Um, so the, the next goal is to actually compute this path integral. We saw that they had actually reproduced the standard solution, even though I integrated out some of the degrees of freedom. Um, and um, the, the intermediate goal is I want to go beyond the semi-classical limit in which I just evaluate the saddle in the gravitational path integral. And I want to actually perform the path integral over these 2D geometries. Um, so for this, uh, I'll have to separate uh, my uh, space into two parts, a near horizon part, for which the space, as I uh, mentioned in the beginning, looks like ADS2 times S2, and a part far away from the horizon where, uh, due to technical reasons, uh, it's safe to evaluate the, uh, the action just semi-classically. So all the important fluctuations that will contribute to the uh, dependence of the density of states uh, with uh, energy at small energies come from quantum fluctuations of modes that are localized near to the horizon, where the geometry is somewhat simpler. So the thing that I can do in the near horizon region is I can expand my diloton field high um, around its value at extremality, uh, so around the value that it takes at the horizon. Uh, plus some fluctuations phi. And um, the way in which I'll write the action resulting in this near horizon region, one could just write it in a phi zero expansion. Remember this phi zero um, is, uh, if, if, this, if chi is just the radius of the black hole, so this is like R squared. This phi zero is like R squared over G Newton or R is zero squared over L Planck squared. So this is precisely uh, proportional to uh, the entropy of the black hole that I was talking about at the beginning of the talk that was huge. So if I take black holes that have a sufficiently large mass, I can try to expand my action in, um, in, in an expansion in one over phi zero and keep only the leading order fluctuations. Um, and then everything that's suppressed is suppressed by factors that are related to the entropy of the black hole. So I can simply disconsider. So if I do that for the simple theory of diloton gravity that I showed above, um, what you obtain is something very simple. And I'll just write the part that's important. Um, so uh, you obtain several terms, but the most inter important terms is, is the following. It comes from this fluctuating value of the diloton around its value at extremality by zero. 
Um, so phi only appears linearly in, uh, in, the, in this new theory. And all higher powers of phi are suppressed by, powers of, uh, by factors of phi zero. And what this phi multiplies is simply multiplies um, uh, r plus the 2D cosmological constant. So this is the only way in which phi appears in the action to leading order and powers of one over phi zero, which implies that phi can just be treated as a Lagrange multiplier. Um, and uh, this, uh, by treating it as a Lagrange multiplier, it means that um, the uh, curvature of the space can be precisely set to be the scale of the cosmological constant. So uh, even, uh, even beyond the semi-classical limit. Um, good. And because I separated my space into two parts, um, if I'm actually careful about uh, doing that and imposing boundary conditions on the curve that separates the space into two, two parts, uh, I also end up with a boundary term. Um, and this boundary term ends up being very important because if this bulk term can be integrated out, this boundary term is the only thing that captures the dynamics of the system. And uh, the very nice thing about this boundary term, so K here is the extrinsic curvature uh, evaluated uh, on uh, some curve that separates the near horizon region from the region for at the asymptotic infinity where the observers are. Uh, the nice thing about uh, this K is that um, it can be rewritten in terms of uh, ADS2 coordinates. So um, ADS2 typically has a metric that goes like this. Um, and uh, if, uh, if I try to solve for tau as a function of z and I plug it back into the action, I get back a theory which is called the Schwarzian theory. It's a higher, uh, it's a higher derivative theory that contains, that looks like t triple prime over t prime minus three halves, e double prime over t prime squared. That is actually the same theory that appears in the low energy theory of the SYK model. Um, and the reason why that is, is uh, mostly because of symmetry reasons. Uh, namely, uh, the ADS2 space has an isometry, which is called an sl isometry. And um, the, the SYK in the low energy limit has an approximate conformal symmetry, which is broken. The group associated to that approximate conformal symmetry is also SL2R. So what the Schwarzian theory captures is the breaking of conformal symmetry in SYK and uh, respectively, the breaking of um, this SL2R isometry in the near horizon region that's obtained for the fact that I put a boundary uh, on this near horizon region. But the important fact um, that, um, uh, that we observe here is not necessarily what the action is, of course, that's very important, but rather what the coupling of the Schwarzian ends up being. So um, if, uh, if one goes all through the math, one finds that uh, after doing this dimensional reduction, the coupling of, uh, of the Schwarzian theory is precisely given by one over the energy scale at which the uh, thermodynamics of black holes start failing. Um, so I'll explain why that's important in a second. And uh, for those of you that are more accustomed to uh, SYK language, uh, this is given by uh, n over j, where n is the number of fermions and uh, j is uh, the uh, uh, typical value of uh, the, the typical scale of the coupling constant. Um, and um, in terms of uh, black hole quantities, I can also rewrite this energy scale E over ESL2 um, as, uh, the, uh, as the ratio between uh, the radius of the horizon to the third power and the uh, L Planck squared. So this is just to give you an idea that this is actually a very small energy scale. Nevertheless, as we'll see, it's a very important energy scale that differentiates uh, non-supersymmetric from supersymmetric uh, black holes. Um, so now, if I actually want to uh, understand what the density of states 
of such black holes is, are, even at low energies. Uh, I actually have to quantize this theory. And this looks like a, a very difficult theory to quantize because it contains higher uh, derivative terms. So how does one quantize this quantum mechanical theory? Um, it turns out that uh, there are various techniques that I won't discuss in this paper that are fairly, uh, that in this talk that are fairly technical. But I just want to discuss uh, how the part, before uh, I mentioned the final result of the quantization of this theory, I just want to mention uh, how the partition function could depend on the scale ESL2 and on the temperature. Um, so in order to determine that, one can rescale the time in the system, uh, just u, do a simple transformation, u goes to a times u. Um, that rescales the temperature or the inverse temperature in this way. And it also, if I want uh, the action of the system in which I rescale the time to be identical to my initial action, that's just also equivalent to rescaling the coupling phi b of q. So by doing this and observing that um, the, the Swartzian has, uh, has this property, uh, you can easily see that the partition function of the theory only depends on the ratio phi b of q over beta. So that's precisely the scale t over ESL2 um, that I discussed in the beginning of the talk. So, um, um, and uh, this will serve as essentially the effective coupling of this theory. So in other words, when t over ESL2 is very large, then this theory can be solved by the saddle point approximation. But when t over ESL2 is very small or order one, this theory becomes strongly coupled. And in, in gravitational language, this could be represented in the following way. So when, um, when T is much bigger than ESL2, the near horizon region looks completely classical. Um, but when T uh, is of the same order as ESL2, what happens is that uh, this, uh, this term, the, the Schwarzian could take a bunch of different values. And if you, ch and all these, bun all these different values are actually important and contribute to the path integral by the same amount. And if you actually track where this Schwarzian came from, it came from the extrinsic curvature. So what it geometrically means for the system to be strongly coupled is that the boundary of the near horizon region actually fluctuates a lot. Um, good. But luckily, as I previously mentioned, one can actually quantize this theory even when this boundary fluctuates a lot. So uh, this was done, um, I think, first by uh, Stanford and Witten using a technique using lo called localization. And one finds that the partition function of the Schwarzian um, can be written as uh, sum over energies, just like the partition function of any other system, where the density of states is given by this uh, factor sinh of 2 pi square root of v. So notice that at large energies, um, as I previously mentioned, uh, the, uh, these black holes have uh, a density of states that goes like e to the square root of v. E. This is precisely the behavior of the cinch, but at low energies, the behavior is drastically different. So if I actually do this integral out explicitly, um, you obtain this very simple partition function um, that solely depends on this ratio, phi b over beta. Um, and um, for which the classical saddle uh, result is just captured in this exponential. And uh, uh, very importantly, at low temperatures, this one loop determinant, uh, which can be neglected uh, when uh, beta is very small, um, at, when beta is very large, this factor can become very important. So now we could take this result and put it together with all the other technical results that one uh, obtains from the dimensional reduction um, and just uh, compute the total partition function of these Reinster Nordstrom black holes. Um, so uh, from other terms in the partition function, one can find the entropy and uh, uh, extremal mass of these black holes. And what this Wartian result captures is uh, what the mass is uh, of the near extremal state. So what are the energy levels above extremality? So we actually now have a picture from this 
of rig a rigorous picture of what happens with these black holes at low enough energies at E order ESL2. So we actually find that, uh, at least naively, the density of states is continuous. There's no gap. Um, so um, uh, if uh, th that means that uh, the conjectures made in the 90s in string theory are drastically different than what we're seeing here. Um, instead, if we actually take uh, a UV completion of this low energy theory, like uh, the SYK model, uh, the, the thing that we see is that instead of the gap being at order ESL2, it's actually at order ESL2 the, times e to the minus s0. So remember that e to the s0 was this uh, huge quantity. Um, so uh, this is a drastically different gap uh, between the extremal state and lightest near extremal state than what was uh, conjectured earlier. Um, but, uh, and another important feature to mention is that uh, this result that the, showing that the density of states is continuous uh, suggests that uh, the degeneracy of the extremal state is much smaller than e to the s zero. So if I am, for instance, to take uh, this UV completion seriously, that the spacing is ESL2 times e to the minus s0, what it means is that uh, the, uh, density, the, the, the entropy does not count the degeneracy of extremal states. Rather, it counts how many states I have within the energy window given by ESL2. So that's a drastically different interpretation of uh, what the Bekenstein Hawking entropy for black holes is. And it's encouraging for systems that have relevance, that are relevant towards ADS-CMT, because on the condensed matter side, we had no reason to believe that the uh, extremal states or the uh, zero temperature states had a huge degeneracy to begin with. Um, and uh, one can see if uh, you look at uh, the new energy, if you take the result for the partition function that we computed, uh, one can see that uh, if you plot the energy as a function of the temperature, there is a critical factor that is important at small temperatures that came from the uh, one loop determinant correction to the partition function. So the classic semi-classical result showed that uh, the energy scales like T squared but at low temperatures, we see that it actually scales like three halves times T. So the thermodynamic argument about uh, radiating Hawking quanta and changing the temperature of the black hole by order one is, uh, is no longer valid. So that's the resolution of the thermodynamic argument, even though we don't have a gap. Uh, let me skip this. Uh, since I have uh, almost no time left, I just want to mention the, um, an important distinction between the statistical mechanics of these black holes and the statistical mechanics of um, black holes that uh, preserve some of the supersymmetry. No. So uh, the black holes that uh, people have studied in string theory are uh, typically black holes in supergravity. Um, and uh, the extremal states are typically called BPS states. That's because they preserve a certain amount of supersymmetry. Um, and uh, the near extremal black holes break supersymmetry. So, but what we'd like is to actually describe um, what the energy scale is between the BPS state and the lightest near BPS state. So that's the same question as what is the energy between the extremal black hole and the lightest near extremal state. And one can do a similar dimensional reduction. The main difference being that now, instead of obtaining just the Schwarzian theory, which appears in the low energy theory of SYK, one obtains a generalization of that theory. So this generalization is called the N equal four super Schwarzian theory and preserves more supersymmetry. So the bad thing when we obtain the when we obtain this result from the dimensional reduction is that this theory hasn't hadn't been quantized, and um, it, its action was extremely complicated. I can't uh, even imagine possibly of writing it down in a presentation. If I actually expand all the terms in Mathematica, I get an action with ten thousand terms. So it's absolutely something crazy. But luckily, there's very elegant. Um, uh, but, but well. 
there's a massive simplification if uh, I only look at the bosonic. So this theory have, has both uh, bosonic and fermionic degrees of freedom. And if I only look at uh, the bosonic degrees of freedom, the action is actually very simple. It's just the Schwarzian um, coupled to a particle moving um, on an SU2 manifold. Um, and the, luckily, uh, there's a drastic simplification that occurs when one tries to quantize uh, this theory using a technique called localization. Um, and uh, one can actually compute the partition function of these black holes exactly by um, computing one loop determinants for all the fields in this action, including the fermionic fields that I didn't show. Um, so we get this complicated results that a result that has some dependence with the temperature. But the important message that I want you guys to take home is that if you take the partition function, this partition function with n equal four supersymmetry, Laplace transform it to determine what the density of states is, what you find is that this theory has a gap between the ground state and the near extremal states. So as opposed to the previous examples where the near extremal states were completely smooth, and started at zero, where the extremal state lives. Now we have a massive degeneracy uh, near extra, at, at extremality. And then um, I have states that have different black holes with different spins that start at different energies. So for instance, the black holes that have spin one half uh, start precisely at a scale proportional to the scale ESL2 for E gap that people have discussed. And then there's a continuum of states uh, that, is, uh, that consists of black holes who have energies that are very finely spaced. Um, so let me just conclude. Um, yeah, I, I just want to mention before I conclude that um, th this computation in supergravity for those interested uh, checks a number of conjectures in string theory. So for instance, it checks that microstate counting is correct because uh, we're all also able to say that ground states are bosonic. Um, and it also verifies the conjecture by uh, conjecture by Maldacena and Suskin about the value of the gap in a special system that preserves supersymmetry called the D1-D5 system. Um, and um, uh, the, the overall, the overarching conclusion here is that uh, the results in supergravity heavily rely on supersymmetry um, and uh, the gap is not universal, nor is the degeneracy uh, of the extremal states. So the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy really measures the degeneracy of the extremal state only when supersymmetry is preserved. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, we've used uh, integrability uh, properties of the 2D Yang-Mills theory and of the low energy theory of, S of the SYK models to account for all possible 2D massless modes appearing in the near horizon region. That led us to uh, compute the density of states of such of uh, near extremal black holes and to resolve the question of what happens at low energies. Um, so we saw that the spectrum looks smooth and starts at D equals zero. And this is extremely different from the spectrum with supersymmetry, which has a very large degeneracy at equals zero and then a large gap. Um, so just to pose some open questions, uh, that are uh, relevant towards uh, exploring uh, the relationship between uh, this very low temperature pictures of these systems uh, and ADS-CMT. One could ask what happens if I ask charge, if I add charged matter to the system. So what happens if I add, let's say a charged fermion under uh, this U1 gauge symmetry? Um, one could also ask what was the role of the ensemble average in the SYK model for these uh, near extremal black holes. And finally, uh, in the supersymmetric case, I mentioned that from the dimensional reduction, one obtains a generalization of the Schwarzian called the n equal four super Schwarzian that preserves a, a great amount of supersymmetry. But unfortunately, there's no currently, as far as I know, there is no SYK model which actually preserves uh, n equal four supersymmetry and is interacting. So it would be very interesting to find whether such a model exists. Um, and maybe that could tell us further about the universal features 
uh, in these supersymmetric black holes. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Luca. Um, so if there are some questions, you should speak up. I have a question. So yes. yeah, go ahead, John. So for, for many years, people have been trying to extrapolate from these uh, BPS examples uh, to more general black holes in the form of the what's called the fuzzball program. Um, so do, mm -hmm. do you think that this this difference that you've you've uh, you've found between BPS black holes and uh, non BPS non supersymmetric external black holes is a, is a crushing blow to that program? Um, I don't know. I assume it depends on what happens to the extremal states in the fuzzball program. One scenario that I could imagine is that uh, you could imagine taking a supersymmetric system and turning on some interaction that breaks supersymmetry. So what I imagine happens in this case is that this degeneracy that exists at zero energy experiences a very large split. So that probably the, the, the split would be large enough that this gap would be closed. So uh, if, if the fuzzball program accounts for such a split, then uh, I would say, you know, the program is not dead. I don't know much about it. But also I want to say that this is a, a computation that's done purely at the level of the Euclidean path integral. So it does not require any UV completion um, as opposed to, I think, the fuzzball program. So this should be a universal feature that would be seen uh, whether or not the fuzzball program is true or not. Other questions? All right. Well, if there aren't uh, other questions now, let's uh, all thank Luca again for a really nice talk.